Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 13995 in the name of Hamza Youssef on violence reduction in Scotland, progress and future priorities. And I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Ash Denham to speak to and move the motion in the name of Hamza Youssef. Minister, 11 minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the motion. Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. It is a pleasure to open this debate today, my first as Minister for Community Safety, and to be able to highlight the significant progress made on this to date to reduce violence in Scotland and what our future priorities are in this area. Over the last decade, recorded violent crime has almost halved, and we've seen a parallel fall in the number of emergency admissions to hospital resulting from assault. That trend is also reflected in the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey. The fact is that violence has been reducing over the last decade. And I would like to pay tribute today to all those who have played their part in driving this downward trend. And that includes colleagues from across the chamber, from Labour and also the Liberal Democrats, who have seen violence as a national priority during their times in office. The hard work that has been taken forward subsequently under this SNP government has resulted in people feeling safer in their communities, with fear of crime continuing to decrease. And it's this direction of travel which is attracting attention from far and wide. Our approach to reducing violence in Scotland is being advocated by the World Economic Forum and is drawing interest from across the world including Canada, Australia, America, Japan, South Africa, Sweden, Denmark, Lithuania and Estonia, and many of whom are now looking to Scotland for answers. And earlier this year, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick, visited Scotland to learn more about our approach to violence. And yesterday, I was pleased to note that the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, announced that the City of London will have its own violence reduction unit and this will be based on the Scottish model and particularly on our public health approach and I wish the city authorities well as they adapt to meet the particular challenges that they may face in London. So why the worldwide interest in what Scotland is doing to reduce violence? Well we've come a long way since 2005 when the United Nations declared Scotland the most violent country in the developed world. The same year, a World Health Organization study of crime figures in 21 European country, countries showed that Glasgow was the murder capital of Europe. More often than not, solutions to violence were sought in the criminal justice system through increasing stop and searches and also through tougher sentencing. In 2016, we increased the maximum penalty for possession of a knife from four years to five years and the average length of custodial sentences imposed for knife crimes has almost doubled over the past decade. People who are convicted of a crime of violence in Scottish courts are now more likely to receive a custodial sentence than they were 10 years ago. And whilst these are important interventions to stop violent crime, we also knew we needed to do something different. And so the Violence Reduction Unit was formed by Strathclyde Police with a specific focus on Glasgow. And soon after, it became Scotland's national centre of expertise. The unit used analysis which showed that Glasgow's most problematically violent areas were also its poorest and with the highest rates of addiction, domestic abuse, teenage pregnancy and suicide. I will. Neil Finlay. Following carefully what she's saying, and I, I agree with a great deal of it, but doesn't uh, the, um, the the current uh, situation in local government, where we see such year-on-year -year cuts to local services, will that not will that not have an impact on some of the interventions that we have at a local level that could reverse some of the good work that's been done, Minister? I think the member should agree that we have given a very fair settlement to local government. And we've also invested substantially in violence prevention programmes, which I believe, and I will continue to talk about this this afternoon, has paid real dividends in Scotland, so much so that the approach we're taking here in Scotland has become, is being looked at from um, other countries around the world. 
violence was recast as a disease, and these were the symptoms. And this was the foundation of our public health approach to reducing violence in Scotland. We come from the understanding that violence is preventable, not inevitable. Since 2008, we've provided the Violence Reduction Unit with an unprecedented £12 million. And they have tackled the root causes of violence rather than just treating the symptoms. Over the last few years, we've supported a number of other violence reduction programmes. For example, Mentors in Violence Prevention. This programme aims to support young people to have discussions on gender-based violence issues. We've provided funding to support organisations such as Medics Against Violence, which targets young people for being killed or becoming victims of serious life-changing injuries. The programme uses health volunteers to deliver education sessions within secondary schools, talking to young people about the consequences of violence and how to keep themselves safe. We're supporting Medics Against Violence to deliver their Ask, Support, Care programme, which aims to give NHS staff, including dentists, and then vets, hairdressers, beauticians, or firefighters, the skills to reach out to those when there are signs of potential domestic abuse. Since 2009, we've also supported the No Knives, Better Lives programme, which has specifically targeted young people aged 18, sorry, age 11 to 18 years old to address the issue of knife carrying. And it's the success of the local partnerships involved including a wide range of diversionary activities funded through Scotland's unique Cash Back for Communities programme, which is making a real difference. But credit where credit is due, our young people are now making better choices for their lives and fewer are now carrying knives. And I was particularly honoured last week to attend a celebration of the Police Scotland youth volunteers at the Parliament to learn about the difference the initiative is making to young people and their communities. We've also supported the development of the Street and Arrow food truck. Um, these programmes offer people with previous convictions wishing to turn their lives away from the cycle of violence, tailored interventions that will support them in achieving this. And yesterday I met with Leanne and Callum, two young people who had recently been supported by the VRU approach. Both of them had been in and out of prison, both of them had addiction issues and had experienced violent and chaotic lifestyles. But both Leanne and Callum, through Street and Arrow's tailored support and intervention, now both have steady jobs for the first time in their lives and are positive, contributing members of their communities. And their lived experience is a powerful demonstration of how this public health approach to justice changes lives for the better. Presiding officer, I'm pleased that our recent programme for government includes a package of measures to better support the victims of crime. And we're extending the delivery of our Navigators programme into two new hospitals, Cross House in Ayrshire and the Queen Elizabeth in Glasgow. Um, this is a hospital emergency department based intervention where Navigators aim to interrupt the cycle of violence. And Callum, who I spoke about earlier, um, mentioned this very positively to me when he said he was at his lowest point and he, they reached out to him there and it made a huge different difference to his life. The expansion of this will enable us to reach out to more people who are living chaotic lifestyles. And these are just a few of the areas which have developed over the years and are being driven forward by the efforts of many caring and passionate people. And today I want to pay tribute to those individuals who make these initiatives what they are, often giving up their own time to help others to turn their lives around. Presiding officer, I'm aware that the Liberal Democrats had submitted a motion today about the importance of through care in our justice system. And while this motion wasn't accepted, we would have supported it because without their right support for offenders of violent crime, it's likely that they'll go back out onto the streets and re-offend. And both the Cabinet Secretary or I would be happy to meet with Liam MacArthur to discuss those ideas further if he wishes. We know that the underlying causes of violence are deeply rooted within poverty, inequality and toxic masculinity, and also Scotland's relationship with alcohol. The introduction of the minimum unit pricing is allowing us to take direct action to tackle the provision of high strength, low cost alcohol across Scotland. And member, members may be aware that our alcohol strategy is due to be published in the coming weeks. But we need to understand violence better to affect a further downwards trend. 
And that's why the previous Justice Secretary, Michael Matheson, commissioned a detailed study to improve our understanding of non-sexual violent crime, and in particular, emerging evidence that violence may be becoming more concentrated on repeat victims and within certain communities. The first part of that research will be published on Tuesday, looking into the characteristics of robberies, and then a report into serious assaults will follow in the spring. We'll continue to work with partners to further our knowledge about what works to reduce violence and to understand where our focus needs to be in the future. So, presiding officer, the recent focus on Scotland's approach has certainly been welcome. During the last decade, we have provided the leadership and support to turn Scotland's record on violence around. Yet we know there are very real challenges ahead. We must look at the new emerging evidence, understand what works, learn from others where we can, breaking cycles of violence across all of our constituencies and change our nation for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I now call on Liam Kerr to speak to move amendment 13995.1. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. It is common when faced with great problems in public services for us to call for a different approach or that we must do more. This debate today is an important one because the motion rightly acknowledges that in the area of violent crime, a different approach was taken and significant progress has been made. But what we mustn't be is complacent and the amendment in my name, which I hereby move, seeks to guard against that. It is important to acknowledge that Scotland has turned its record on violence around. No longer are we, as reported by the UN in 2005, the most violent country in the developed world. Nor is Glasgow the murder capital of Europe, as reported by the World Health Organization that same year. And at least part of that stems from another event that year when a novel approach, as described by Ash Denham, was taken by Glasgow's Violence Reduction Unit. It was one which extrapolated from health to treat the cause rather than the symptom and treated violent behaviour as a disease that spreads from one person to another. And at least to some extent, it appears to have been successful with homicides and facial trauma patients falling across the country. And therefore, I'm pleased to echo the Minister's thanks to the VRU for the work that they do. In particular, I'd also like to note the Navigator programme, which is currently running in Glasgow and Edinburgh. This places professionals in accident and emergency departments to engage and support patients at what are called reachable, teachable moments in order to break the cycle of violence. This is a great initiative, and we need to see it expanded, perhaps even beyond what the Minister is suggesting. I think there'll also be consensus on the importance of early prevention through education. And again, I echo the Minister's bringing up the No Knives, Better Lives programme. Last November, I watched the powerful and often harrowing play, Valley Song, run by that programme. Ultimately, that theatre created by young people, for young people, drives home to the roughly 12,000 who saw it, the very serious consequences of carrying a knife. But, President Officer, this is only part of the picture. We have much further to go in making Scotland safer and tackling all forms of crime. And I know this because when those in power pat themselves on the back as they, quote, recorded crime levels, as the definitive measure, they fail to recognise the hidden figures. And crucially, they fail to recognise that correlation does not necessarily equal causation. In an answer yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary said, I would hope that everyone would look at the data and see where we have had success. But respectfully, this is a flawed argument because raw data doesn't automatically make for a causal link to be made. And it stands to reason when you think about it. As was described in the World Economic Forum report, victims of violence are more likely to go to A&E than they are to go to the police. And the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey shows at least two-thirds of crime is going unreported. And the SNP's own crime counting rules mean that violent crime figures don't include assaults which result in a broken nose or a loss of consciousness. Ask someone if they've been knocked, who's been knocked out if they have been a victim of a violent crime or not, and I would suggest the answer is a resounding yes. But yes, of course. Minister? I just, I do want to reinforce this point that although we all say, you know, recorded crime is at a 43 year low, I do accept the member's point that not all crime is recorded. But we do see 
um, overall across the different measures, so that's recorded figures, any admissions which the member has just mentioned, and also the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, there is a long-term and sustained decrease of crime. Would the member accept that? Liam Kerr. Well, I think what we need to look at uh, is, the, the answer is no, uh, and I'll go on to describe why, because if you look at, uh, if you look at the data that's being recorded, uh, then large numbers of violence crime is going unreported, and the data on which the conclusions that are being uh, based on becomes unreliable. Official statistics will offer us part of the picture, but for Ashdenham to, to, to rely on them exclusively is dangerously complacent and dangerously misleading. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> let, let me address the first point, uh, because I want to do that. Last year's recorded crime publication showed a clear rise in crimes of violence, including homicides, attempted murder, serious assault, and robbery. More recent data from Police Scotland confirms violent, sexual and drug fueled crimes are increasing from between 7 and 11 percent in the last year. Crimes involving offensive weapons rose 10 percent. Police now deal with over 161 domestic violence calls a day, which of course are just the incidents that they hear about. And most shamefully of all, presiding officer, one's chances of being a victim of crime if you live in, Scot in one of Scotland's most deprived communities, remain the same as they were 10 years ago. We cannot be complacent on violent crime, or, as the Scotland on Sunday put it, we cannot allow a hunger for good news to blunt our critical faculties. Who's after an intervention? Bolton? James Dornan. Thank you. Um, earlier on, you talked about not having the, the figures, uh, the, 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 the official figures not being the way to do it. The minister got up and told you that accident, and you used the example of accident emergency, going to accident emergency instead of the police. The minister got up and told you that the accident emergency figures were going down. You then responded by saying, aye, but that doesn't matter. Can you please explain to us how, what it is exactly that you want? Do you want every single instance to be recorded by somebody? I don't know, Robocop or something? Well, first of all, Mr Kerr, you're not going to lose time on that, but also can members remember not to use the U word? I'm fed up saying it. It is the member. You do not term somebody that. I am the U person sitting in the chair. Mr Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. Look, I don't disagree. I accept that hospital admissions for the trauma are down. I accept that, and I accept that progress has been made. My point, Mr Dornan, is that... Or my point to Mr Dornan is that... Uh, <laughs> progress we, we cannot allow ourselves to become complacent and that is what I'm concerned at from the government and look my further example of this just yesterday the Minister for Community Safety stood up and stated that the evidence points towards a long-term and sustained reduction in antisocial behavior I think the point has just been reiterated there only for Jamie Halcrow Johnson to adduce police Scotland management figures which clearly show that in one year, antisocial behaviour has increased by 25% in parts of his region. The minister was thus forced to concede the 2017-18 report suggests a slight increase in overall antisocial behaviour. It is a 5% increase, by the way, across 23 local authorities. So our message and the reason behind our amendment is clear. Celebrate the successes. But stop ignoring the reality on the ground. Stop ignoring what police and the experts are saying and start an honest dialogue with the people of Scotland about the difficult decisions that have to be made to reduce violent crime. On which note, I really can't, Cabinet Secretary. On, on which note, as uh, Rennie, Niven Rennie makes clear in Holyrood magazine today, policing alone will not drive reductions in violence. But that is not to say that officers on the ground are not part of the answer. They are. Yet almost every area of Scotland has fewer officers on the front line now than five years ago, and more cuts are on the way. Strong community policing is essential to prevention and detection. And if the SNP are serious about combating violent crime, they will get officers out of backroom roles and onto the front line where they can make a difference. Deputy Presiding Officer, we should congratulate and build upon the successes of the Violent Reduction Unit, but we cannot close our eyes to the fact that violent crime does appear to be increasing and local police officers are being cut. The SNP have to acknowledge the true level of crime on their watch, and they must put victims first by keeping dangerous offenders off our street. That's what our amendment seeks to reflect, and I commend it to the Parliament. Thank you. It Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 13995.3. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. I'm going to begin uh, my speech uh, by restating some of the facts, but I 
don't think I'm going to apologise for that because I think they bear repetition. In, in 2005, the UN published a report declaring Scotland as the most violent country in the developed world. And a week later, WHO figures led Glasgow to being named the murder capital of Europe, which we have heard from other uh, speakers. That translated into 70 killings a year. And at that time, more than 1,000 people required treatment for facial trauma alone, many as a result of violent stabbings and beatings. Indeed, I recall being told by my cousin, who was working as a junior doctor in A&E in Glasgow, about the, the realities of her having to learn about knife trauma, and it was harrowing. And in that same year, the Violence Reduction Unit was founded. Now, I don't want to spend too long rehearsing the background of the VRU. I think the Minister did an excellent job of setting out the work that it has done. But I do welcome this opportunity to debate this topic, to examine and mark the advances that have been made. But we must also analyse the impact, not just in terms of what has been achieved, but also why, looking at the methods that have been used and why they have been successful. Because above all else, what is important is that we continue to combat violence in our communities and make progress in terms of reducing the number of people who are victims of violent crime. And I believe that there are three key principles why the VRU approach has been successful. First is analysis, understanding the factors uh, that drive violence. Second, prevention. Once that you consider the, th the, the, the issue through a public health approach, you understand that violence breeds violence, that it spreads like an ep epidemic, that violence is a social disease, and in some cases, a social norm. And once you have worked that out, you can treat it. And third, is that cross-agency working is vital. Violence is not something that can be tackled by the police alone. It requires government, social work, employment, courts, prisons, social enterprises, schools, and families to all intervene at the appropriate times and places. And I think this approach is something that ought to be copied uh, in other areas of government, and in particular in drugs. And we have spoken recently quite considerably about our drugs problem in Scotland and the need to treat it more as a health rather than a justice issue. But ultimately it is both. And perhaps this model is one that should be copied, uh, that analysis, prevention and cross-agency working could be used to tackle Scotland's shameful record on illegal drugs as both a criminal justice and a health issue. And the VRU has been wildly successful. The murder rate in Glasgow has fallen by 60%. Facial trauma numbers have halved. Violent crime is down on every measure on the basis of the 2005 levels. But I also, and I also want to note yesterday's very welcome announcement by London's Mayor Sadiq Khan of a commitment to create a London Violence Reduction Unit. And I also understand that the West Midlands have taken a similar public health approach. So Labour are happy to support the motion put forward by the government today. But in having this opportunity to debate this topic, we must, yes, focus on pro progress that is vital, but critique is also fundamental because, as Liam Kerr put it, we cannot have any ounce of complacency in terms of our approach to this. And that is what our amendment seeks to do today. And it makes two fundamental points that we hope the government will acknowledge this evening in the vote. In the, in the spirit of continued consensus and cooperation on this issue. First of all, we must recognise that the risk of a cross-agency approach is what happens when those other agencies are not fully resourced. And the second is that while long-term trend is clear, the short-term trend is much more worrying. On resources, the Parliament knows well Labour's criticisms of the cuts to public services over the last decade under the SNP, and particularly those cuts to local government. Local government is a key partner and the cuts to local government have been stark and that can only have a negative impact on the ability of the whole system to deliver the reductions in violence. But we must also recognise the great work that the third sector uh, organisations do in this area. They are also experiencing huge difficulties and constraints on their budgets and we should be mindful of the effects that that could have. We often hear terms such as joined up thinking, coordination and early intervention that can only happen if local government and the third sector are properly and adequately resourced. Of course. Fulton McGregor. I thank the member for the intervention. Does he welcome the, the recent investment from the Scottish Government and to local authorities to, to women offending and addressing that issue? Daniel Johnson. I'll congratulate the Scottish Government when it funds local government adequately and stops year-on-year -year cuts to their resource uh, grant from central government. 
So we, know, we also know that from official statistics that violent crime has seen long-term decrease. I acknowledge that. And it, it should be celebrated. However, more recently, government statistics are also clear that non-sexual violent crime has shown a 14% increase in the last two years. The clear up rate, the percentage of those crimes being solved, has also fallen to 77%. So these are concerning trends and ones that I raise because I'm keen for the government and for parliament to not just pat ourselves on the back, but to understand that there is much more to do and much more uh, focus on tackling these issues. If this Members in this last minute. Um, I think the member may be rising in order to ask what my position is on their amendment this evening. Um, and I am, it's with regret that we will not be supporting the Conservative amendment because of the inaccuracy within it. However, I do agree with much of the sentiment that the reality is, and as the Violence Reduction Unit will say themselves, only 43% of violent crimes are reported. That health admissions as a result of violent acts in our community are much, much higher than reported crime. And I think that while those statistics are not necessarily outside of international norms, they must be recognised. And so in that, I, I understand the sentiments, but because of the inaccuracy, and if I believe in a, a full, frank and honest discussion, I don't believe that we can vote for an inaccurate amendment. And I see the presiding officer uh, 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 nodding at me, so I will conclude there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on John Finney. Mr Finney, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, presiding officer. Um, this isn't necessarily the debate I thought we were going to have. I have to be perfectly honest with you. Um, uh, the, the motion talks about the recognition of Scotland's progress in turning violence around, and, and I think we should applaud that. I really think we should applaud that, and I think we should be, uh, express gratitude to the people that have delivered that success. There's no green amendment into it because I don't take offence with anything. It's in the, the, the government motion and, and you know, substantially, I, I don't suppose my opposition colleagues do either. But what I would say is recognising success uh, um, is not the same as assuming that there's perfection. There certainly isn't perfection. We have a way to go. And, uh, you know, I, I personally, as someone who's uh, not particularly numerate, don't, uh, can't juggle the figures all around. It has to be seen over the longer term, and I think it's ir irrefutable that there's tremendous progress being made. And we know that. We hear from the Minister there are people coming looking for answers. I wish these people every success. I think it's tremendous that Sadiq Khan's coming here, because I think there are too many young men in London whose lives have been lost. And if there's a lesson that can be learned from Scotland, and any life saved, then that, to me, is real progress. We had a talk in here, we had a, a debate in here the other night about UN Peace Day, and I, I, I quoted Botus Butus Galli, I think I never thought I'd find myself doing. And when he was Secretary General, he was asked to respond to the Security Council uh, um, about um, how they would improve peacekeeping and peace enforcement. Now, I think these are key phrases we could align with this debate here. And, and in his Respond Agenda for Peace, he uh, came up with the, the, the term peace building. And that's post conflict social and uh, political reconstruction activities at preventing a relapse into conflict. And what it distinguished from peacekeeping and peacemaking uh, was the insistence of what societal uh, wide uh, reconciliation. Now, I think that applies to policing, and I think we have, we draw the line between, um, I mean, proactive policing is very good, enforcement is clearly reactive, but treating this disease and the fact it's recognised as being a disease in the way it has, in the collaborative way it has, I think has been very, very helpful. We've seen some movement in government, and I, for one, welcome the fact that the, the government moved the drugs portfolio from justice to health. Um, it, the the, the uh, Labour motion uh, notes success, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and we will support the Labour motion. Uh, like the Minister, I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't enter the debate had the Lib Dem motion been accepted, because I think there are significant issues there that we, we, we need to, to, to look at. So I, I'm very happy to reflect on the, the success that's there. And, um, excuse me, um, it's, there's a way to go in the issue, because, of course, although that drugs portfolio has changed, we have the issue of supervised injecting facilities. I, I would like to see an end to this so-called war on drugs. I mean, I think language is very important. We do tend to use a lot of violent imagery in our language. Yes. Yes. Thank you, pardon. No, no, you have to call you first. A little technicality. Liam Kerr. I didn't disagree up until that point with anything you'd said previously, but I will now. Uh, but does the member not accept that the contribution made by Niven Rennie at the weekend is very important and, and that to avoid complacency we should pick it up in the amendment to the motion today? It, there is no way that... It, uh, same to you, Mr John Finney, now. Thank you. I do beg your pardon. Sir. I have to earn my keep. On indeed. you go. Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. 
No, we won't be supporting a motion for the very reasons Mr. Johnson outlined there. And I think, you know, you can't stand up and bandy figures about and then not be accurate yourself. That's simply uh, not, not inappropriate. I have the highest regard for Nibir Rennie, indeed his predecessor, Mr. Kernaghan, and I think there's been a very positive contribution made by the Violence Reduction Unit, and the reality is that Mr. Rennie will contribute to that, no doubt building on the, his many, many years of experience. So I think there can be a, 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 a legislative spot in relation to drugs and the violence that's been associated with that. Unfortunately, it's not in the gift of this particular uh, uh, building here at this time. I want to talk about domestic violence because there's been huge strides taken in respect of that and I think the, the approach that's been taken, much has been, I think already the term navigators has been mentioned a number of times and I think that's a very positive step. We also heard from the Minister about various initiatives. I mean, I think with frequency we all uh, commend the work of Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland. And it is about the structures that are in place to support. It's not simply always about money. It is about the structure. So specialist police units, specialist units within the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, decisions taken about policy, about fast tracking, specialist courts, and something that I will keep coming back to, and that is judicial training, because there still is um, ignorance, I'm afraid, um, abounding on the bench on occasions, hopefully a reducing number of, of times. So uh, the legislation that deals with the treatment of complainers, witnesses, domestic abuse, well, these are all things that will encourage people to come forward if they have confidence in the system. And yes, we have a way to go. I think one violence that's uh, been recognised in legislation and it was uh, fascinating work to do on the Justice Committee was the coercive and controlling behaviour and the, the psychological violence that we see and indeed the work of the, the violence reduction unit in workplace bullying and bullying in the school there and the violence that we see there visited through uh, uh, technology nowadays. Um, so I think it's important that there's uh, uh, support uh, for, for children recognising the, the, the important problem that comes with exposure uh, to violence. Uh, exposure to the disease of violence. Um, someone said to me in relation to my member's bill, which will be discussed here in, in coming months, uh, that that's the last acceptable form of domestic violence. And one thing that was in support of the, the legislation, which enjoys the support of police officers, social workers, paediatricians, women aid, and many other organisations. And it says, there are no studies showing that children's behaviour improves as a result of physical punishment, and most show that there's been a negative impact in a child's long-term well-being. Um, so there's lessons about violence, and there's lessons about what we uh, learn from it. And we, we, can, all, we can all learn, uh, and uh, there's no one more than me on that particular issue who knows what you can learn. So uh, I think the role of alcohol, that's in part been addressed. Sorry, I, I see you there. Okay, uh, can I just conclude by saying early intervention, the support that the third sector provides is vital and it's important that, that we support them. Thank you. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Officer, I, I think it's the first opportunity to do so. Can I uh, welcome Ash Demon to her new post? Congratulate her actually on the, the tone of her opening remarks and, and certainly uh, indicate my willingness to take up the offer she's extended in terms of uh, further discussions around uh, the issue of through care. I, a little like John Finney, I, I, I saw this as an opportunity to put on record uh, my thanks to the police and the range of public and third sector organisations uh, in health, education, uh, social work and elsewhere who've played a part in achieving an impressive reduction uh, in violence that we've uh, seen in Glasgow. Niven Rennie is correct, of course, when he cautions um, against um, seeing the reduction in, in violence um, to a level that would suggest that we have cracked it. Um, too many communities across the country still endure uh, unacceptable levels of violence, and A&E departments, as Mr Rennie warns us, continue to deal with uh, far higher numbers of serious assaults than those reported to the police. Uh, this is clearly a powerful argument against any sense of complacency, but it's not, however, a reason not to acknowledge uh, and celebrate the progress that has been made by the VRU. Progress achieved in large part, as others have said, by adopting an innovative approach that views violence as a public health issue requiring treatment as we would uh, a disease, such has been the success of the approach, uh, of course, uh, that we've seen the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, announcing his intention to adopt a similar uh, model in that city. And certainly the recent escalation uh, in violence in communities across London uh, has been alarming, characterised very often uh, by tit-for-tat attacks that bear all the hallmarks of a contagion. In that respect, hopefully the VRU approach will prove as successful in London 
as it has patently been in Glasgow. But in the Scottish context, where do we go from here? How do we build on the success of what the VRU has achieved to date? And is it realistic to think uh, that we'll ever get to the point where, in Nevin Rennie's words, uh, we can say we've cracked it? The motion, while setting out future priorities, is less clear about the actions that will accompany these, uh, addressing underlying causes such as poverty uh, or inequality and factors to do with attitude or behaviour takes time. Shortcuts, while superficially appealing in order to allay public anxieties, are unlikely ever to be truly effective and deliver lasting improvement. The VRU has shown that the holistic approach uh, structures do work. This is a lesson that can be carried through to other areas of our criminal justice system. And one area where Scottish Liberal Democrats believe there's more we can be doing and which would deliver real benefits in reducing the risk of violence and other types of offending behaviour is in relation to support we provide those emerging from the prison system. Clearly extending the presumption against ineffective short-term prison sentences in the first place is important. The government must, uh, I believe, press ahead with introducing this as quickly as possible. But for those in our prison system, more can and should be done. Making the provision of through care more widely available, not just limiting statutory provision to provi uh, prisoners serving four years or more, would be a good start. It would also be consistent with the principles underlying uh, the success of the VRU. A recent HMIPS report confirmed this, but overall uh, found that, quote, there are lengthy waiting lists for many key programmes and that, quote, prisoners are at risk of being released into the community without having completed treatment programmes designed to reduce future reoffending. That is disappointing and shows that we can and must do better. Providing support to individuals while they're in prison helps to break the vicious cycle of recidivism. This includes support with issues such as finding housing, substance misuse, education, um, money management, and ensuring continuity in this support then after release um, is, is, is essential and must be seamless. As the VRU shows, coordination is able to deliver real benefits, benefits for the individual, benefits for the community and benefits indeed for wider society. But as it stands, these benefits aren't being fully realised. In May this year, David Strang said, I have seen too often people leaving prison with approximately £75 in their pocket and with the prospect of having to wait several weeks before being eligible for basic benefits. Many end up homeless, he added, with a clear con consequential risk of them reverting to reoffending behaviour, keeping their own company and in many cases ultimately violence. The success of the VRU relies on accepting the need to take a longer term perspective. Based on David Strang's account, the same cannot yet be said for how our courts and prisons treat violent offenders. I accept delivering proper through care across the prison population is likely to be costly, but all the evidence shows that failing to do so is considerably more costly. Deputy Presiding Officer, for those uh, across the public and third sectors who have contributed to the se success of the VRU and many more who are working hard to reduce violence that blights too many of our communities still, we owe it to them to be bold. Enabling the expansion of good quality through care in prisons and communities across the country is one uh, way of demonstrating uh, that boldness of ambition. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And, and before I move on to open debate, because of the limits of our technology, if you intervene, your request to speak button goes off. Uh, so I'm just one of those things, perhaps we can overcome this. Surely if we can send people into space, we can get buttons to come back on just because you intervene. We'll leave that where it is. Um, but there you are. Remember that. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Miss Mackay, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say I really want to associate myself with the the uh, comments from Liam MacArthur about through care. I've not touched on it in my speech, but I really do agree with them on all, all points and much of what, what John Finney said as well. Well, much of what I'm about to say has actually been said in the opening speeches, but I believe that it is worth repeating because it is a success story. The overall um, picture shows that Scotland has made great progress in reducing violence and there has been a sustained long-term reduction in violent crime in Scotland over the last decade. And I believe this is the result of the Scottish Government adopting a public health approach to tackling violence as advocated by the World Health Organisation. The emphasis is on prevention activity, uh, such as education and early intervention, which we, we know always works, 
uh, partnership working with the NHS, local authorities, community groups and appropriate law enforcement um, as necessary. By continuing to tackle the causes of violence, not just the symptoms, we've broken down the relentless cycle of violence and reduced the terrible impact that it has had on individuals, families and communities. Presiding officer, I was born in Glasgow, uh, a city which was once known as no mean city. Uh, as we've heard, it was described as the murder capital of Europe by the World Health Organization in 2005 due to gang violence and its aggressive reputation. Thankfully, we all know that's no longer the case due to the progress that's been made, which has seen Glasgow's murder rate drop by 60%. Even the World Economic Forum's praised Scotland's effort in reducing violence, with the new approach seeing violent crime in Scotland decrease by 49%, almost half in the last decade. The Scottish Government is fully committed to preventing and reducing violence, investing over £14 million in violence prevention measures and programmes since 2008. And a key part of the, the government's work to tackle violence, as we've been hearing, is through the Police Scot Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, SVRU, uh, which is a national, renowned national centre of expertise in violence. It aims to reduce violent crime and behaviour by working with partner agencies to achieve long-term societal and attitudinal changes and by focusing on enforcement to contain and manage individuals who carry weapons or are involved in violent behaviour. The SVRU began as the Violent Reduction Unit established by Strathclyde Police in 2005 to target all forms of violent behaviour, in particular knife crime and weapon carrying among young men in, around Glasgow, in and around Glasgow. Following the success of the VRU, the programme was extended nationwide and the SVRU has been funded by the government since 2008 to the tune of £12 million. Pounds. Yes. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the member for the intervention. But doesn't the member share my concern that so little is being done to reduce violent crime in the most deprived areas, such that there's a victimisation rate that remains fundamentally unchanged for a decade? Rona Mackay. I'm just not sure where, how you can evidence that, that so little has been done in the less deprived areas. I don't know where that's coming from. I think a, a lot of focus has been on the deprived areas. Um, Similar programmes exist around the world uh, but are not delivered through the police. Violence reduction programmes in Chicago operate through the university, for example, while similar programmes in New York and Baltimore are administered through the city's health departments. So the SVRU teams are a mixture of researchers, police officers, civilian staff and former offenders who've turned their lives around and are now succeeding in helping others to do the same. Its early pioneers, John Carnahan and Karen McCluskey, will, I believe, go down in history as being instrumental in eradicating the unacceptably high levels of violence in Scotland. They had a monumental task of making a difference, and they did, by offering hope to so many disengaged and disadvantaged young people. They offered them hope, and that was what they needed to turn their lives around. The SVRU introduced the Mentors in Violence Prevention Programme after seeing its success in, in America, again learning from good, good practice. Um, and MPV trains students the skills to safely intervene and prevent violence in Scotland. Presiding officers, the Minister said we learned only this week that Scotland's approach to tackling violence has been adopted by other areas of the UK. London's Mayor Sadiq Khan has already been incorporating elements of the public health approach in his knife crime strategy and a violence reduction unit has been set up in a similar model, model to our own. Presiding officer, earlier this month I held an event in Parliament to highlight the work of Professor Ross Ducher, Assistant Dean of the University of the West of Scotland, who's researching a radical new approach to rehabilitating and healing violent offenders in Denmark. Professor Ducher is a Scottish criminologist known primarily for his work on gangs, masculinity, street culture, violence and gang desistance, as well as policing procedural, procedural justice and focused deterrence strategies. He's also the author of a new book called Gangs and Spirituality. His work has spanned across three continents of the world, having worked with the most marginalised gang members in the streets, in youth clubs and in secure accommodation in prisons. The event in Parliament focused on groundbreaking new work on the healing effect of yoga, meditation and breathing to prevent offending, with members of the Danish Breathe Smart programme demonstrating the technique. To say the, the event was fascinating was an understatement. We heard from Jerry Rasmussen, a self-confessed former violent criminal whose life has been turned round by this practice. 
He was lost, had a high ACEs count, and had only known a life of violence and criminality, but through the patience of the Bree Smart team, he started to live again. It was emotional and uplifting to see the real man behind the formerly macho, defensive, and desperately unhappy offender he once was. To use a cliche, it restored my faith in human nature and reinforced my view that we can and we must find alternatives to reducing violent behaviour and reoffending. An organisation called The Art of Living provides classes and programmes to individual and organisations throughout the UK. Their vision is a stress-free, violence-free world, and who wouldn't want this? In conclusion, presiding officer, I'm proud that Scotland is at the forefront of tackling violence. Of course, we must never get complacent and there will always be work to do, but we have come a long way since the days of No Mean City. Thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to start today by welcoming and acknowledging the improvements we have seen in Scotland since the rather damning report by the United Nations in 2005 that declared Scotland as the most violent country in the developed world. And according to the University of California, Scotland at that time, we had a higher violent death rate than in America. These reports, of course, as we've heard, came after the World Health Organization had already revealed in 2002 that 34.1% of males had carried weapons at least once during their lifetime. Clearly, that is not a description of Scotland that any of us ever want to see again. And in last week's child poverty debate, I highlighted the principle that we cannot just battle with the symptoms of an issue, we have to deal with it at the root. And I think today's debate highlights an exact, ex excellent example of doing just that. So I want to add my congratulations and welcome the incredibly impressive results that the Violence Reduction Unit has achieved. Um, and part of the reason I, I want to talk about that is, is some of what Daniel Johnson mentioned, because I love the description of the approach that the VRU took, addressing the problem like a disease. Firstly, diagnosing the problem, then analyzing the causes, examining what works and for whom, and finally developing the solutions, which once uh, evaluated could be scaled up to help others and I think it's brilliant that Scotland is able to have gone out there and genuinely starting to help others and it trusts me no end that London is coming to us for help so I, I think that's something to be really celebrated but I think perhaps most importantly with the VRU um, they weren't seeking a quick fix they wanted to change society's attitude towards violence uh, and bring that partnership working between police health education and social work um, and they don't mention the third sector on the, the front of their website, but I'm sure they're there. Um, and that's what makes it possible. And it's often that long-term attitudinal change in society that are missed when actions and policies are tied to short-term funding solutions. Um, and I've experienced this myself. And, and often funding ends for effective projects simply because funders are seeking new, exciting ideas. So I am pleased that, that more than a decade on the formation, from the formation of the VRU that they're still going strongly and are still continuing to roll out the principles on which, which um, they started out their work. Um, I was also e extremely impressed that they're the only police members of the World Health Organization's Violence Prevention Alliance. You know, it, it, it is changing the attitude towards it just being something that is enforcement and really thinking about it as something that is embedded in society that we need to address. So the Scottish Government is quite right to highlight the success and I'm very happy to add my voice to welcoming this. And here comes the but. There's always a however, isn't there? Um, so my colleague Liam Kerr and others have identified that in, in celebrating success and welcoming all this, we mustn't be complacent and we mustn't take our eye off the ball. Um, because while we are keen to stress that nationally crime rates are falling and things are improving, it isn't always the whole story. Um, and we've heard Niven Rennie quoted a few times, and, and he has said there is still too much violence. And A&E departments are dealing with far higher numbers of serious assaults than those are reported to replace. So I had a look at what's going on in, in some of the areas in the south of Scotland. And in my own region, there are some worrying trends underlying the national figures. So figures from the past year in the, in the borders show that there's been a 13% increase in recorded crime alone. We've seen a 20% increase in sex offences, a 17% increase in housebreaking, and other offences, including weapons and drugs, have risen by 29%. Now, yeah, sure. 
<laughs> Cabinet Secretary. Can, can I thank the member uh, for doing so? I think it's been a very thoughtful contribution from, from Michelle Bannatine. I thank her for that. Just can I caution about using the word trend when we're using one year figures? Because the downward trend has absolutely been, uh, the, 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 there has been a downward trend uh, throughout the decade. And I think just using one year figures can be a dangerous. I just caution. Uh, again. Michelle Balland. <coughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to accept that, but, but I think there's a concern when they suddenly start rising again. And I think that's something we need to be looking at. Um, I accept the overall trend is down and I'm not disputing that. Um, and I have to say some progress is being made um, this year in the Scottish borders. Um, the, the current council, Conservative and Independent-led council, is using some of its budget again to support a community action policing team. And that's having some very positive effects. Um, I would, however, question whether it's right that our local councils are actually contributing to policing on our streets. And again, maybe that's something we should be thinking about. Um, Fully enough, when I, when I turn to Midlothian, and uh, I hope the Deputy Presiding Officer will forgive me for this, but in a recent um, issue of the Midlothian Advertiser, she herself quoted the, that crime is at its lowest for over 40 years, quite correct, and um, quotes that it proves that the SNP's approach to issues such as knife crime is paying dividends for our communities, nationally quite correct. Um, but, unfortunately, again, in Midlothian, overall crime has risen by 12%, um, one of the biggest rises in crime of any local authority in Scotland. And the local area commander, Chief Inspector Kenny Simpson, is regularly raising the subject of antisocial behaviour in the same paper. And he felt compelled to write an article entitled Number of Youths Armed with Weapons is Cause for Concern, in which he referenced a recent spike in vandalism. So, I, I would caution in, in the same way that national figures can sometimes hide local issues. So in welcoming improvements, we must also be willing to acknowledge what we still need to tackle. Um, and there are still issues that concern myself and members of the public. And we've visited some of those debates here around a soft touch approach, early release dates for offenders, or fewer frontline officers. So overall, I do welcome and congratulate everyone who's contributed to the positive national trend, but there is still work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the name check. Uh, I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr McGregor, please. Yeah, th thank you, President Officer. And it gives me great pleasure to speak in this debate. And I'll start, President Officer, by declaring an interest as a registered social worker with the Scottish Social Services Council. I spent four years prior to my election working in the criminal justice field. And so, as you will imagine, I was pleased when I heard that the World Economic Forum had recognised Scotland's progress in reducing violence and the complete overhaul of our record and approach. Crime in Scotland, as others have said, has decreased significantly since 2006-07 and in no small part thanks to the Violence Reduction Unit, which was founded in 2005. And as others have said, the figures are very stark. Between April 2006 and April 2011 in Scotland, 40 children and teenagers were killed in homicides involving a knife, between 2011 and 2016, the figure fell to eight. But let me be very clear, every death is unacceptable and this is still eight too many. So to put Liam, um, Liam's mind at ease, um, it's, it's, they're by no means being complacent. In Glasgow, this figure between the same 2011 and 2016 period was none. This is where we need to get to for the whole country, but it is clear that the plan and progress is working. Presiding officer, to people like myself that have worked in this area, this is a pleasing but not surprising start. I know firsthand the great work done by all the agencies in the criminal justice system, the work helping to rehabilitate those who have served a, a custodial sentence, the Change Now Caledonia programme who work with those who commit domestic violence offences, substance misuse and addiction programmes, youth justice approaches, the list really does go on. And I would dispute Neil Finlay's assertions about but, um, public services not having the money to do so because it's not what I see and what I experienced myself. I could literally spend the whole six minutes just listing various services, public and third sector, but um, of course I'm not going to do that. But I think it is only right that I pay tribute to all those who work across the sector, including my old colleagues, who I know do a fine job in challenging circumstances. But, President Officer, at the core of our approach is a welfare and human rights based model. That's why we have social workers carrying out much of the intervention work and not parole officers, as is the case in England. Because as we know, and as has been said, violence is a complex issue which comes in many forums. It is also clear there's a strong link between poverty, adverse childhood experiences, and violent crime. There is also a well-documented, and not just now, there is also a well-documented 
and strong and complex interplay between unemployment, homelessness, mental health and addiction issues and offending and violence. Therefore, I'm a staunch believer that we should be focusing on the causes of violence. And that's why it needs to be said, and it needs to be said clearly, that these Tory welfare and austerity cuts are plunging our children and vulnerable people into dire poverty and hunger and will only limit the chances of our youngsters and increase the likelihood of violent offending. We should all in this chamber, every single party, be applauding the Scottish Government in reversing this trend in, in the face of these inhumane policies with, for example, cash back for communities and other initiatives. No, not just now. Since 2008, if I get time later, since 2008, the Scottish Government has invested £14 million in violence prevention measures. A key part of the Scottish Government's work to tackle violence, of course, is through the, the well-mentioned the, the Scottish Police Violence Reduction Unit. The SVRU was set up with the aim of re in reducing violent crimes and behaviours by working in conjunction with partner agencies to achieve long-term societal and attitudinal change. It is clear that also focusing on enforcement to contain and manage individuals who carry weapons or who are involved in violent behaviour is essential. And this in the SVRU is now internationally recognised. And there's some really good national policies also, like the presumption against the short-term sentence. Absolutely vital if we are serious about reducing reoffending. There is, of course, also the debate on remand, which will be brought to this chamber in a couple of weeks following the Justice Committee inquiry, and I look forward to taking part in that. But of course, there needs to be a scope for local interventions. We heard how in Glasgow gang culture has been challenged, helping to reduce violent crime. And in my own area of Cope Bridge and Christen, yes, statistics are looking very good, and the national redu reduction of violent crime is certainly reflected, but we're no means ready to celebrate just yet. There are significant issues with mental health, and officers report routinely being the first port of call for someone who needs this treatment. There are also major issues with drugs, with statistics for Lanarkshire regularly making the local news. But I want to finish beside an officer by focusing on alcohol and its link to violent crime in my part of the world. Just a couple of weeks ago, the local paper, The Advertiser, released shock, fig shock figures that more people were admitted to Monkland's A&E for alcohol-related harm than any other hospital in the area, 1,800 patients since 2015. And this is perhaps not surprising in an area devastated by years of deindustrialisation, Tory policies and, and, and unemployment, resulting in generational uh, unemployment, crime and poor health outcomes. Most people in the chamber will have heard of Buckfast tonic wine, or commonly referred to as Bucky, a high-volume alcoholic drink associated mainly with Cope Bridge and Airdrie. I won't fight with my colleague Alex Neil over it, but also with most of the other Lanarkshire towns. Indeed, most towns will have a, a rival who, over who is the Buckfast capital. But in reality, presiding officer, this is not a new issue or not something to be mocked or scorned at. I found some really startling figures. Between 2008 and 2012, Buckfast was mentioned in an average of 2,800 and 93 crime reports per year by Strathclyde Police. And this works out at a number just under eight a day. And I can also back that up by my own reflection over um, crime reports when, when I was working in the sector. And it's not an a, a alcohol product that's subject to minimum pricing. And this isn't coincidence. Of course, there's a link between alcohol misuse and violent crime, but there is clearly a problem with this particular choice. One of the main problems, it's made of glass. And accounts of violent incidents, bottles appear to be more frequently used weapon than any other, making Buckfast not only a precursor to violent behaviour and crime, but a tool that is readily available to use. No, uh, Mr. Fulton, I'm joining just a finishing. long list of politicians calling on the company to consider other materials for the bottles. A survey conducted at Polman Young Offenders in 2007 has striking results. Of those who had been drunk at the time of their crime, 43% had been have drinking to come Buckfast. To post, There's clearly a link, albeit stats are not fully up to date. No, sir, I will finish by saying, I had other things to say about local agency, I will finish by saying that these statistics are very good. They're not surprising to me. There's a lot of good work going on in the area. I commend the Scottish Government for the work that they're doing in this area. But as everybody has said, I don't think finish, the ministers please. are saying that there is more work to be done. Thank you. Call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Neil Finlay. Presiding officer, if I could start by um, joining my colleague Rona Mackay and associating myself with Liam MacArthur's comments around through care. I think unless we can get that right for predominantly men leaving prison, then we're setting them up to fail and it's not going to help anybody. Um, violence is a complex issue which comes in many forms, beyond the obvious health problems that result from violence, beyond the psychological trauma and the physical injuries, violent behaviour in itself is an epidemic which spreads from person to person. To break cycles of violence and reduce the harm done to individuals, their families and communities, we must tackle the causes and not just the symptoms of violence. 
I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to this approach and in particular the work of the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, which has been recognised internationally as being at the forefront of Scotland's approach to preventing violence. The unit team is a mixture of researchers, police officers, civilian staff and former offenders. Their remit is to tackle violence in all its forms, from gang fighting to domestic abuse and bullying in schools and the workplace. They have had many successes, which is reflected in the announcement on Wednesday that London will echo Scotland's approach to violence and treat it as a public health issue. This public health approach, as advocated by the World Health Organisation and adopted by the Scottish Government, is effective. Prevention activities such as early education and early intervention, alongside appropriate law enforcement, is essential. Crime in Scotland has decreased and most people feel safe in our communities. However, I think that in celebrating successes in tackling violence and crime, we also have a duty to hear and act on some of the less comfortable facts. John Carnahan tells us that crime figures are only a small measure, and not a great one at that, of levels of violence. In Scotland, we found only one third to one half of people in accident and emergency as a result of violence report it to the police. The ones which hadn't reported to us had resolved to deal with the matter themselves, which led to more violence. With that in mind, I'd like to pick up on a particular strand of work from the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, which is based in hospitals. I was really pleased, absolutely delighted to learn in the programme for government that the Navigator project was being extended and that Navigators will shortly be starting work in Crosshouse Hospital, which serves my constituency. The aim of the Navigator project is to break the cycle of violence for the individual and ease the pressure that violence places on the NHS to stop the revolving door of violent injury in our hospitals by identifying and supporting people within emergency wards, emergency departments or wards at the point and time of need. They do this by talking to patients who've been affected by violence and then using a wide range of contacts, services and resources outside the emergency room to offer help and support to those patients to change their lives. Commenting on the work, Donna Maguire, a senior emergency department consultant says, this is possibly the most valuable non-medical change in the management of a and &E in the whole course of my career. I think for inner city hospitals, this should be a standard means of engaging with the homeless and disenfranchised people that we have coming to our departments. The reason I say this is because the current mechanisms are failing or the people are not engaging with them. Whereas here, we're getting the navigators catching people at a time when they're amenable to some intervention. I was also struck by the comments of those currently working as navigators when asked the best and worst part of their job. Sam Fingland said the best bit was probably seeing the changes that people make themselves. She says she's just there to ignite a little spark, that it's rewarding work. The job does exactly what it says it, it will do and just helps people to navigate and make changes. Tam is also a navigator. He says the best bit is the outcomes and he thinks that most navigators would say the same. It's what gives you the energy to come back weekend after weekend, seeing that little bit of positivity in a person's life that wasn't there before. We're not superheroes, we're just helping people to save themselves by giving them hope, energy and self-belief. He says the most difficult part is that you sometimes end up wanting to change more than they do at that particular point in time. Maybe they haven't fallen hard enough yet or they're just not ready for it. He says it's difficult, but we have to remain positive and at some point when they're ready, they'll get back to us. Presiding officer, I said in opening that violence is a complex issue and it is, but it's, it's not inevitable and tackling it is all of our business. I'd like to commend all of those involved in that really important work, particularly those on the front line who are kindly, compassionately and tenaciously refusing to give up on those that society finds all too easy to ignore. I'd say to them, keep up the good work and never ever stop challenging and pushing those of us who could be described as being in the most corrosive gangs of all. Because Scotland has made great progress, but as long as anyone suffers something that's not inevitable, as long as even one person is suffering from violence, we still have a power of work to do. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by James Dornan. Hey, thanks, President Officer. Uh, recently, I've found um, speaking to a number of people on the front line, whether it be prisoners or drug users, counsellors, uh, medical staff, 
police or police officers, they paint a very realistic and sobering picture of what is going on in our communities. Uh, of course, all of us welcome uh, any reduction in crime, but the repeated trotting out of figures telling us that crime is at an all-time low level and, and, and the like has little relevance to people whose lives are impacted by crime, violence, drugs, and other uh, social manifestations of an increasingly divided society. Yeah, we'll get it out of the way quickly. James Dornan. But more manners would be very helpful. The, the whole point I, I was going to say was, would you not accept that those who before would have been affected by violence and are not being affected by violence see the benefit of the low drop in, the, the, the serious drop in crime? Uh, can I say, first of all, please, that you should always speak through the chair. Uh, I would say, secondly, we should always be polite to fellow members, and it is for me to decide uh, whether something is impolite or otherwise. Neil Finlay. Thanks, President Officer. Of course, I, I said we welcome that, absolutely. And they will, anybody who lives in a community where there's violence welcomes the fact that things are happening that reduces that violence. Of course, uh, that is the case. But crime and violence are a condition of the society and, and economy we live in. And only by treating it as that ill that people have spoken about have we begun to make progress. That was the philosophy behind the then uh, Labour-led coalition establishing the violence reduction unit in the first place. And there was a recognition that poverty and hopelessness and the impact of deindustrialization had created the conditions for crime and antisocial behavior and violence to flourish. And only by addressing those deep-seated problems in affected communities could we possibly deal with the often violent manifestation of them. Where once there was reliable employment, secure housing, cohesive communities, People have been left in precarious jobs, scarce or unaffordable homes, and public services in apparently permanent contraction. And in many areas, drugs have taken hold, destabilizing communities and setting individuals on paths of self-destruction. The combination of an ideological obsession with austerity and spending cuts feeds division and alienation and frustration and powerlessness. And it's unsurprising that some young people look at their future and compare it to that of their peers and think that there's a uh, another uh, easier way out through drug use or dealing in organised crime, theft or other criminal activity, which is often the gateway to violent conflict. And I think we have to look way beyond that. Public services are absolutely the key. They're the glue that holds our society together. If we cut youth work, if we have a mental health crisis, if we cut cash going to drug and alcohol projects, if we see social workers drowning in casework, if we see the educational divide widen if we condition young workers to expect no more than a low paid precarious job and if we leave communities in a state of decline and shrug our shoulders saying it's just a consequence of austerity then we haven't a chance of reversing the situation. Um, the decision by, the, by Scottish Labour to treat violent crime as a public health issue was the right one and we need to apply this to other areas of society too and in particular drugs policy. Daniel Johnson mentioned that the violence reduction unit was set up as, as a result of 70 deaths a year through violence. We've got 1,000 deaths a year through drugs, 14 times as much. Where's the national emergency in this? This is a crisis. It's a crisis and we are doing very little about it. Because if we think we can arrest our way to a drug or crime free society, we are seriously deluded. We need to invest in local services and projects like the VOW project in Edinburgh and the Lothians that works along with Aid and Abet, uh, a, a, a charitable organisation. They've been reducing violent offending by encouraging repeat offenders to address their behaviour and engage with mentoring services. Support workers from Aid and Abet are ex-offenders, including my constituents, the inspirational Kevin Neary and Donald Tomilovich. They spoke in Parliament at an event I organised earlier this year. They have reduced offending by over 80% uh, amongst the client group they work with. They've got an uptake of almost 50%. It's a strategy that accepts that we can reduce crime and get people back on the road to recovery more quickly and effectively by working with them rather than against them. And there's clear evidence that it's working. They have saved £7 million uh, during the time of that project. And yet it exists on a shoestring 
They're having to get lottery funding to keep it going. There's no certainty of it continuing. It shouldn't be under constant threat. It should be rolled out across the country. So I, I, I would urge the Cabinet Secretary, if he will agree to meet with me and representatives of VOW and Aidan Abet, uh, so we can look at how we can not just secure the funding for the project, but how we can get projects like that rolled out all across the country. Because these kind of schemes make moral, political and financial sense. Our aim should be to create long-term attitudinal change uh, rather than any quick fix. Um, finally, President Officer, I spoke about drugs policy. Uh, I will continue to speak about this because we have a national crisis on our hands. If having the highest number of drugs deaths in Europe does not qualify as a public health emergency, then I surely don't know what does. Call James Dornan to be followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, the reasons behind this debate fill me with no complacency, but a great sense of pride in what Scotland has achieved over the last decade and a half. And I'll tell you why, because I suspect that I'm the only speaker uh, in this debate that has lived through being a teenager in the 60s and 70s, where I was blessed by listening to the best music and watching the best football team of all time. But the one blight for most teenage boys back then was the threat of violence. Never a week went past without hearing of a friend, schoolmate, colleague, or even a family member being the victim of a random attack or being caught in the wrong place when two gangs were fighting or coming home from football. To see Glasgow going from that Europe's murder capital to a place where the World Economic Forum can congratulate us on the huge decrease in both numbers, uh, murders and violence gives me great hope for the future. Rand random violence, murders, serious assaults and other offences still occur? Of course they do. But we've come a, such a long way from the days when the surgeons in Johannesburg were recognised as the finest Scotch gunshot surgeons in the world and the surgeons of the Royal Infirmary the finest at dealing with stab wounds in the world. So how do we get here? If you go to the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit website, it welcomes you with this phrase, violence is preventable, not inevitable. And these words are important to me. As I look back over my younger years, I can't help but wonder how many young men and women were written off as a life of violence, both perpetrated by and against them, was seen as inevitable. Society just expected certain behaviours of young people from certain areas to develop because they were caught in a cycle and that was just how it was. Of course, even back then, there were organisations who worked to deflect young men from this path of destruction, and they too should be remembered for their good works. However, it was only when the VRU took an example from Boston and decided to approach this culture of macho violence differently that there began to be real strides in getting these men to see there was another way. And I congratulate the Labour uh, 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 Coalition on bringing that in at the time. It took guidance, time and a better understanding of the many whys behind violent behaviour before the problem could be faced head on. Experts now recognise there are complex and varied reasons as to why a person may have violent tendencies. And that's why the SVRU is due all the praise that's been heaped upon them, not only in the report, but in this chamber today. Sign off, sir, when Scotland becomes an independent country and we're banding names about for this statue or some other form of public recognition for people that have helped to make Scotland the modern, welcoming, peaceful society that it has become. Two names at the very top of my list will be John Carnahan and Karen McCluskey. Without their drive and vision, I doubt very much we would be having this debate today. Oh, and in case I forget later on, can I just say how pleased I am that Niven Rennie is now the person in charge of the SVRU. I can think of no one better. The, new, the, the great thing about the VRU was they knew it couldn't be done by the police alone, so the multi-pronged public health approach was adopted. And I was absolutely fascinated to read some of the other tactics they used when they involved people like hairdressers, dentists, firemen, and vets to identify if a person was a victim. We must congratulate also the Scottish Government and their continuing support for the SVRU, without which I doubt it would be able to continue as it does today. Now, I know I've been concentrating on mainly male-to-male -male youth violence, but the reason for that is simple. It's still by far the most likely type of random violence to occur. However, we should not forget the other types of devastating violence which can manifest in many forms, sexual, physical and of course emotional abuse. It's a multifaceted problem that can only be tackled with a rounded and inter-organisational approach. In my constituency alone, there's some amazing work being done with projects such as the Casimil Youth Complex a project, which is uniquely run for young people by young people. And this project takes young people off the streets and puts them into community art programmes. 
It seeks to find their own unique talents and gifts and encourages them to be used in a fantastic way through theatre and music. The Southside Boxing Club, which trains in Mount Florida and has over 100 members, keeping them off the streets again and giving them a sense of self-worth that many of them may lack. There's also the amazing work being done by the Waves and Daisy Projects, which seeks to support young women, all women, fleeing the horrific crime of domestic abuse. The Waves and Daisy Projects provide more than a refuge. They provide information and support in order for broken women and children to be able to rebuild a life. Presiding officer, every year in June, a group, also in Casamilk, called Lost Lives, invite the community to take part in a memorial garden. The garden is a wall of flowers placed by friends and families who have lost a loved one due to violent crime, abuse, or other horrendous circumstances throughout the years. This summer, my staff and I took our time to read the many cards placed along with the hundreds of flowers. There were memories of brothers, sons, husbands, fathers, sisters, daughters, and friends. Not one more or less tragic than the next. I wish I could show this chamber the photos of that garden of loss because that alone would remind each and every one of us why we must continue in our fight to reduce violent crime and I would agree again with Neil Finlay to reduce the, the use of drugs, to encourage future generations to follow a different path and to also support the Scottish Violent Reduction Unit's motto and declare that violence really is preventable and not inevitable. Thank you. Call Morris Corey to be followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too welcome Ash Denham to her new post and, and I hope it all goes well for you. Um, we're here today to discuss how further reductions in the most harmful crimes can be secured. Violence in Scotland is undoubtedly a real concern for the people we represent. We cannot afford to deny the threat of violent crime in our communities, especially if it is not dealt with openly and effectively. I welcome this opportunity to debate the ways in which violence reduction measures can progress and achieve success in Scotland's future. I recognise that some crucial progress has been made by the Violence Reduction Unit. The original aim of this unit was to target the worsening levels of violence in Glasgow. This, their remit was sp has spread to include the entirety of Scotland with a goal to tackle all forms of violence. This includes bullying in the workplace and in schools, domestic abuse and gang fighting. The Violence Re Reduction Unit works closely with groups in health, social work and education to create ways in which the causes of violence and solutions to the problem can be developed. We can see the efforts made by the Violence Reduce Reduction Unit and I welcome its contribution to lowering crime in Scotland. Indeed, its public health approach to violence is argu has arguably halved the number of facial traumas uh, patients in Glasgow's hospitals and reduced the murder rate in the city by 60%. Yet, while the Scottish Government's hailed this as a complete success, we must recognise that the problem of violence in Scotland has in no way disappeared. Official statistics do not include the innumerable instances of unrecorded violent crime, which surveys and health data have shown and are much higher than what the Government has claimed. Uh, as Niven Rennie has made clear recently, that for, a, that for a progressive society, there is still too much violence. We note that the VRU has since issued a clarification on the headline figure used in that report, but the fundamental point remains that the figures being issued by the SNP in press releases remain unfortunately inaccurate. Indeed, the Scottish Crime and Justice, and let me just carry on, please. Uh, indeed, the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey has estimated that only 37% of crimes were reported to the police in 2016-17. This means we do not have a true picture of crime rates in Scotland and therefore how to tackle the problem effectively. It is undeniable that violent crime is unfortunately still a, an issue in Scotland. It represents around a third of all crime with an estimated 231,000 violent crimes affecting adults in Scotland last year. And worryingly from 2014 to 17, the number of violent crimes increased by 45,000. This is especially alarming discovery when we discover that the cuts have been made in the police force of Scotland. Uh, by restricting our policing, the safety of our communities will fail to take seriously. Surely this has contributed towards the rise in street robberies and the number of criminals that are gaining confidence in their belief that they will be caught. We will be not caught. I'll take an intervention. Thank you. I thank the member for, for the intervention. Uh, can I just remind the member that the number of police is up by 938 and what we inherited. And if he thinks that we are not doing enough for police numbers, what does he make of the Tory government under which, of course, it has fallen by 13% by 19,588 officers in England and Wales? 
Well, uh, Morris Corey. Um, Presiding officer, I mean, the fact is that the SNP made it their flagship policy to protect police numbers and to support them and actually to provide more support and various programmes. So they can't deny that they haven't done that, but equally that needs to be put in place and therefore more useful, uh, effective use of the police is there. And there are other issues that they can, well, I'll come to later on, which will reinforce that. Falling police numbers have also meant that the threat of gang crime will become harder to target. This rise in the number of gangs has become alarmingly uh, alarming by their increased use of firearms and violence. And therefore, there needs to see, we need to see more community police officers in our communities where local knowledge is paramount. And that refers to my point, which I made to Cabinet Secretary already just now. Violence uh, continues to be a problem in our communities, and so the government must admit the accurate state of crime in, in Scotland. The Violence Reduction Unit have themselves raised the issue of continued violence and warned against ignoring unrecorded statistics. Without a governmental uh, re recognition of the rise in violent offences, the work of the VRU cannot reach the full potential of its excellent service which it can offer. In order to, for the government to take significant steps forward in, in violence reduction, the unrecorded rate of violent crime must be taken into account, and the crimes such as attempted murder, serious assaults, are too common for the government to become complacent, and rather we should find ways in which they can be actively re reduced, and particularly to reduce the reoffending rate. And as I've seen as I've gone around the prisons in my, in my role, the government must expand such successful projects, and here I give praise, uh, as a prisoner support program as introduced in some uh, prisons in Scotland, particularly Low Moss, and that has been successful. I would encourage the government to look more at that program, and I referred to that earlier on. It is my belief that preventative measures should be in place from the start. In this way, the issue of violence can be tackled before it is time to develop and worsen, and surely one area of prevention which needs more focus is education. We know that more children are being excluded from school for using knives and makeshift weapons, and these instances of first-time offences can easily lead to more serious crimes, such as drug taking, violent and sexual assault, which are all on the rise in Scotland. For this reason, a great effort must be made to ensure that primary school pupils are taught the dangers of violence and its consequences as a result. I note that no, knife, no Knives Better Lives initiative has aimed to deliver training in schools to deter young people from carrying knives, yet more funding is needed to raise awareness in schools across the private areas of Scotland and support more initiatives such as this. This will help to ensure that young people are dissuaded from becoming perpetrators in the future, and it will also lessen the potential for victims of violence where more, which is more likely to affect younger adults. Thus, a greater commitment in education of young people is needed on the seriousness of violent crime, which should be a fundamental property. And also, I'd like to uh, add that this is amply demonstrated in the creation of Police Scotland's Young Volunteers Organisation, which I saw the other day here in the Parliament, and I congratulate them on doing that, and that's another way of making it work. So, some praise there. In connection with this, I, meet, I believe more... Uh, you I believe have more to robust come to a close, management. please, Mr. Cordy. Yes, I will do. Uh, it will go a long way to lessening the potential for violent crime. Surely this preventative measure is a, giving a better understanding of how to pinpoint the issues and prioritising and prioritising educational training. And further, the Scottish Government should encourage you armed must forces come veterans to, close, please. to join Police Scotland when they leave the forces, an excellent skills resource. In, in conclusion, Deputy Prime Officer... No, I think you've concluded, Mr. Cordy. I hope the Government will agree with my suggestions. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is Bob Doris. I appreciate the opening speech by the Minister Ash Denham and can I take this opportunity to welcome her to her post here this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Crime is down, violent crime is down and down dramatically over a long period of time. That's factual. The trend began back in the last couple of years of the previous Labour and Liberal Democrat executive and progressively built on by our current SNP Scottish Government. The work of the Violence Reduction Unit and its various partners are clearly a key driver to that success. Now, my apologies that I am not going to speak more about their work, but many have done so already this afternoon in this debate. But it is worth also pointing out that the establishment of the Violence Reduction Unit, its success was based on political consensus to place violence within the public health domain and we have to continue that consensus however we go forward from here this afternoon. However, I also think the Minister also acknowledged that the nature and the manifestation of violent crime might be changing in our communities, that violence may be presenting in a more concentrated fashion in some communities and that there could be more repeat 
victims. That's not, com let me develop this point further, that, that's not complacency. And some of that crime may be highly and significantly likely to be unreported also. And we have to have a better understanding of these patterns and changes, and we have to develop our violence reduction strategies accordingly. Now, I have to say, I don't think that's complacency. I think we've got a political agreement on that point. Liam Kerr. Thank you, and I thank the member for taking the intervention. But just to go back to the point that I put to Rona Mackay, because she was unsure of the re research, it was the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey from last year that said that violent crime victimisation rate for adults in the 15% most deprived areas has shown no significant change since 2008-9. So does the member not think that, it, or does the member think that that's something to celebrate, or will he not agree with my amendment that we must show no complacency about stats like that? Well, it's the, shame, it's the real shame that you've wasted my contribution time with that intervention because I've already said that there are issues and I've already said the government's acknowledged that and we have to better understand those patterns of crime and do something about it. But, you know, I'll, I'll continue nevertheless. Uh, perhaps we have to look uh, at how we direct resources better to those areas when we identify the nature of that crime those crimes within our communities. And I'll say to Maurice Corrie, for example, when we look to put more money into deprived areas, you'll have my support if you agree with me, as I do, that the proceeds of crime funding should not be spread evenly across the country. It should be even more concentrated in deprived areas for those who are the victims of crime actually suffer at the coalface. I think to get political consensus on that, because that means money leaving Morris Corrie's constituency and going to my constituency in Maryhill and Springburn, we have to be politically brave if we're serious and we're sincere about tackling these issues in our deprived communities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but violent crime is down. We can celebrate that without complacency. And I very much take this debate in the context of what we can do next. And I'd like to look a little bit at that. Uh, now, I would like to talk about um, Open Gates, an organisation in my constituency, uh, and uh, they support prisoners and ex-prisoners through uh, an employment and training programme with the aim of reducing reoffending um, and stopping uh, revolving backdoor into prison, which has happened all too often. But crucially, uh, it's run by individuals, including the irrepressible Pat Clark, who have managed to break the cycle themselves, and they will use their experience to mentor and support other offenders to do the same. It's a social enterprise organisation that will manufacture, recycle and upcycle furniture and white goods and sell on to the general public. Uh, based just off Postle Park at, at the canal in my constituency, I, I would invite either the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary to come and see for themselves the work that they do. I would also make the point that how they are funded can always be precarious at times, and perhaps there has to be a, a more substantial support, whether via direct funding of the Scottish Prison Service to build a sustainable model around that, and we could build on that across the country. So there's a, a positive suggestion on how we could take things forward. Now, I, I don't think that uh, I, I can be involved in this debate and not mention various, of the youth, various youth organisations in my constituency, whether it's Royston Youth Action, North United Communities, Young People's Futures, or New Rhythms for Glasgow, uh, who all do work with young people, but crucially, they're at their best when they're funded to do family work. So not just diversionary activities for young people, but working with young people and their families. Because where young people are perhaps going off the rails, some of that behaviour uh, and downward spiral is replicated within the wider family. I know that's a model the Violence Reduction Unit also used. So maybe thinking more imaginatively about how we can enhance funding to organisations that I've mentioned in a way that better networks that support to the wider family rather than just the young person. The final point I would like to make is time's almost upon me, presiding officer, is domestic violence was mentioned earlier on. I think it was Mr Finney that mentioned that, and we know the success of the White Ribbon Scotland organisation, and actually globally. Uh, and it's unacceptable, well, it should be unacceptable, uh, for uh, domestic violence, gender-based domestic violence, male to female. We have to create a society in our most deprived communities as well where it's just as unacceptable for male on male violence. Now that's a real challenge, I have to say, in some communities, in some areas, 
but that's the nut we have to crack, and we'll do that by placing it in the public health domain, and that's why I celebrate the success of the Violence Reduction Unit and support the motion before us here this afternoon. We now move to the, the closing speeches, and I call Daniel Johnson. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by uh, saying something that I should have said in my opening remarks, which is, I mean, I really think that as we talk about this debate, we really ought to bear in mind the people on the front line delivering uh, this approach, uh, whether that's police officers, social workers, people working in our schools and third sector, because it's only by them challenging their practices, changing their practices and working holistically that we have managed to reduce violence in Scotland. And I think in particular the, uh, for the police that has uh, meant a, a fairly significant culture change, but one where they recognise it's important for them to have relationships on the ground in the communities where violence is such a problem. And that's where I think this debate has been useful and it's not been uncontroversial uh, at times there have been heated words, but that is maybe the point. I think it would have been disappointing if there hadn't been points of controversy because this is a challenging subject. Not all of the things that we will be discussing uh, in connection with violence in our communities are easy, but fundamental three things I think have been discussed. I think first of all is the understanding or diagnosis of the problem. Secondly, that, 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 to challenge ourselves regarding where we can do more and then ultimately looking to the future. And in some ways the approach to this problem was brought home to me um, when I was traveling through to Glasgow one day. And in, in the best traditions of Scottish public life, you always bump into interesting people on that Glasgow train. And I indeed on once one occasion uh, sat down next to a, a key uh, representative from the police federation who was discussing the, these very issues and talking about how uh, we, uh, we would make progress. And he discussed the, 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 the fact that it was about making early interventions, spotting the, the problem issues and intervening before they escalated to full-blown cr criminality, uh, looking at things about such as re the reduction in school exclusions and what impact that had had, likewise the reduction of short-term sentences and the fact that we had um, uh, reduced the number of people going uh, to appallment, and indeed asking whether or not those were chicken or egg uh, factors. He even raised the, 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 the fact of lead in fuel. Now, that might seem random, but it is a reality across the Western world. The reduction in lead in fuel, it is considered by some, has led to a reduction in violence. My point is this, it is not obvious or straightforward, all the factors that lie behind the reductions in violence, and we must be unflinching in looking at all of them and the consequences of the decisions we make in public policy they have ultimately reducing violence. Now, Niven Rennie has been invoked many times, and I've not been following Twitter, and I have no doubt that he has given a verdict on whether or not we are accurately reflecting or not, but there is no doubt that cracking it is going to be complicated and we're not there yet. And I think Michelle Ballantyne highlighted on the, the, the disease analysis, and there are so many factors that we need to look at. And me, I just introduced one further one. Now, members will know that I take a keen interest in uh, ADHD. The reality is this. In the general population, 5% of people have ADHD. In the prison population, it's 25%. In Poland, it's 40%. These are some of the things that we need to look at. Not just looking at, at, at kind of tackling uh, crime or uh, in terms of making arrests, but also actually looking at the underlying factors, looking beyond simply substance misuse or violence and asking ourselves, are there other underlying factors? Is it you know, going beyond simply mental health that's important, but other underlying uh, psychological issues or um, uh, neurodevelopmental issues? And I think a number of other members also talked about the complexity of the cultural issues that we need to face when we tackle, look at this issue. Fulton McGregor, Ruth McGuire, James Dornan, and I'd agree with them about the music of the 70s, uh, by the way. But I thought in some ways the complexity was, was again highlighted by Fulton McGregor talking about alcohol. It's not just alcohol consumption itself, but even the containers that the alcohol is consumed uh, within. And we need to ask ourselves why. And ultimately, I think one of the key cultural questions, why is it that only 43% of violent crime is reported? Now, regardless of what side of the argument you have been on this afternoon, I think that is a fundamental question that we need to ask ourselves. Why is it in some of our communities some parts of this country that people feel unable or that it's inappropriate to report time crime to the police. So maybe that can be one conclusion from this afternoon. 
But I'd also like to also uh, do another thing that I forgot to do in my opening remarks and join with others in uh, expressing my support for the sentiment of the Liberal Democrat amendment, which wasn't taken. I think, again, Liam MacArthur made two important points that, again, if we are going to tackle this as a cultural issue, looking at how individuals are supported as they both uh, come into contact but also leave the criminal justice system, uh, whether that's through, through care or other issues or uh, measures, are, is hugely important. But he also made one other very important point, that ultimately that the levels of violence in our society will reflect poverty and inequality that we have in Scotland. Regardless of whatever else we discuss, whatever other measures we, we talk about and the need to tackle them, ultimately, if we don't tackle that, if we don't tackle inequality and poverty in Scotland, we will not fundamentally be tackling the, 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 the most fundamental cause of violence in our community. And I cannot put that more strongly and, and make more emphasis than, uh, than that. Finally, and in conclusion, I would just like to re reflect my colleague Neil Finlay's remarks. I think drugs... Uh, uh, and substance misuse are one of the most tragic outcomes of poverty and inequality. I think they're also a consequence of withdrawal of services. And I would like to ask, uh, uh, end on one final note, which is, is this. If we're looking at the future about what further things we could do, one further idea maybe is, should we have a VRU for drugs so that we can tackle that issue on a cross-agency, uh, cross-service, holistic manner in the way that we've tackled violence uh, through the VRU. Thank you. I call Margaret Mitchell. Six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's obvious from today's debate that there is support and recognition chamber-wide for the excellent work which has been carried out by the Violence Reduction Unit. As the community minister, who I too also welcome to her post, uh, Rona Mackay, Michelle and Michelle Ballantyne all stressed it's a model other countries are now looking at to copy. So having said that, I consider it a great pity that my party will be unable to support the motion this evening because the government failed to make clear whilst the Violence Reduction un Unit has made amazing strides in reducing violent crime. The Scottish Government has failed to acknowledge that there is a serious underreporting of actual incidents of this type of crime. If we are, uh, briefly. Yep. Daniel Johnson. I understand that point. I wonder if uh, the, the Labour amendment was uh, 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 voted through, whether or not the, the, your benches would, uh, sorry, the Conservative benches would support the motion then. Yeah. Margaret the same Mitchell. problem would be it would amend the motion and therefore, sadly, um, uh, if it was voted through, not. Um, if we are to address, as we all wish to do, this serious problem, then the, debated, the, the debate must start with an honest assessment of the situation. So I commend Niven Redden, Ray, the former president of the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents and now director of the Violence Reduction Unit, for recently, recently highlighting that violent crime is significantly underreported. And as Liam Kerr explained, this is based on evidence that hospitals are dealing, dealing with far higher numbers of serious assaults than are reported to police. Not only that, according to Police Scotland, uh, non-sexual crimes of violence rose 8% from 1,900 crimes last year to 2,051 crimes this year. And the number of crimes that involved an offensive or bladed weapons are in the same period have risen to over um, 10%. This evidence backs up anecdotal evidence from lawyers that even when a crime such as a serious assault is presented at A&E, it is then downgraded to a lesser crime when officially reported. This has included instances where a police officer has been the victim of an assault. Deputy Presiding Officer, our frontline officers are under enough strain and stress carrying out their daily duties without having to cope with the downgrading of assaults, which then means that recorded crime statistics paint a rosier picture than might actually be the case. For it's crucial that, as in any discussion of official statistics, we never forget that behind these unreported assaults, there is a victim of violent crime who, for a variety of reasons, is either unwilling to seek 
or unable to get justice. One way to ensure that victims of crime and members, if I could make some progress, if you don't mind, Mr. Finney, if I've got time, I'll do it later. Uh, one way to ensure that victims of crime and members of the public have confidence in our police force and in our justice system is through visible local policing. It is therefore deeply concerning and I believe a retrograde step that in communities such as Addington, Police Scotland have not only closed a police counter several years ago, but are now selling off property that police officers have been using as a base for the area. Although it's no longer functioning as an active police counter, members of the public in Addingston found it reassuring that police officers have been using the four, mount, uh, four, four mentioned station for their breaks. Now there is no such visible policing. The Minister, James Dornan, uh, and the VRU itself highlighted the excellent work carried out training hairdressers, vets and firefighters to identify signs of domestic abuse. This is a good example of the necessary early intervention to which John Finney, Daniel Johnson and Ruth McGuire all referred. Here I'd like to commend, can I make some progress please? Um, here I'd like to commend and raise awareness about the fantastic Animal Garden, Guardians programme run by the SSPCA. To tackle violent behaviour in children and young people, the programme is funded solely through charitable donations and the RS Macdonald Charitable Trust and works in collaboration with social work, educational psychologists, CAM specialists, teachers and children's charities such as Bernardo's. These stakeholders refer children who have either committed animal cruelty or have the potential to commit, commit animal cruelty to the SSPCA. The SSPCA then works with these children on a one-to-one -one basis in a fun and non-threatening way and encourages them to recognise both their own emotions and what the animal may be feeling. Since the programme launched in May, the SSPCA has been inundated with referrals with children as young as four being referred. Given that on average 14 children a week are excluded from schools in Ms. Scotland Mitchell is finishing. for an assault with a weapon, this SSPCA programme is clearly invaluable. Presiding officer, quite simply, it is only by ensuring transparency and honesty about the level of violent crime that it can be tackled effectively and victims can have confidence to report it. I call Hamza Yousaf to close the debate for around seven minutes. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I say that uh, I've had the great honour and great pleasure of uh, opening and closing many debates in this Parliament uh, in my six and a half odd years of, of being Government Minister, but I, I don't think I could be prouder of the achievements of the VRU and, and, and closing a debate as I am today um, and, and celebrating the undeniable success of, of the Violence Reduction Unit. I am uh, unashamedly Glasgow uh, born and bred, educated, I represent a part of that city and growing up uh, in Glasgow undoubtedly, uh, and James Doran touched upon this, undoubtedly there were some areas that I just would not go to, especially uh, as a young Asian male, I would avoid uh, those areas because of the perception uh, if nothing else, that something uh, could happen to me. Not so now. I'm so proud that we've moved leaps uh, and bounds uh, in my uh, home city. But if you told me growing, uh, as, when I was growing up that Glasgow would be held up as a global model for violence reduction for the rest of the world, I, I would have thought you'd been downing too, much, too many bottles of iron brew. I would just not believe it whatsoever. So the fact that we have seen such great success it's, rightly, uh, it's right that we all from across the chamber uh, recognise that success because we should all be collectively proud of the fact that the World Economic Forum has held up the VRU uh, as a great model that, of course, uh, uh, Labour's uh, 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 Mayor uh, in London, Sadiq Khan, has also, of course, now uh, replicated, uh, will replicate the VRU model uh, for London. The list of countries that Ash Denham read out uh, in relation uh, to, to, to who is looking at the VRU model, all of us, all of us should be proud uh, of that. Many of us around this chamber, our political parties, have been part of that success. I think we touched on, Ash Denham touched upon 
uh, the Labour uh, Liberal uh, Coalition uh, that, that came up with the idea. Cathy Jameson, the Justice Minister, I think at the time, uh, came forward with the idea of the VRU. Of course, in Glasgow, that has been mentioned so many times throughout this debate, that it's not one city administration, not, the, not just the current city administration that believes in that model. Uh, of course, the previous city administration uh, believed in it too. And then the, the ongoing work that we've been bringing forward uh, as, as a government, uh, I think, too. So we all ha should be collectively uh, proud uh, of that. And, and the downward trend is really important. I do emphasise that word trend. It's, a, it's an important word because it's very easy to take one or two year figures. And I'm not dismissing those figures. I think it's, it's right that members mention them, particularly in relation to their own constituencies or region. But it is important that we look at the long term trends. And the long term trends are absolutely uh, undeniable. Recorded violent crimes fallen by 49% since 2006, the lowest level since 1974, a 56% fall in the total number of emergency admissions to hospital, uh, I will in a second, and the number of young people under 18 convicted of handling offensive weapons has fallen from 489 in 2006 to 91 in 16-17. I am going to come to a but, but before I do, please, uh, I give away to Liam. Liam Kerr. Secretary for the intervention. Just very briefly, Niven Rennie said at the weekend, when someone from government stands up and says crime is at a 43-year low, I always say it is recorded crime that's at a low. Does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge the point he's making? I do, I mean, I'm telling you, Seth. Uh, members were right to, to raise uh, issues around unrecorded crime and unreported crime. And I think we should all absolutely uh, pay focus to that and attention to that. Although some of the figures used were two thirds, that, that, that is incorrect uh, in relation to, to, to unreported. Uh, that is overestimating uh, it. But nonetheless, I do accept uh, the, the, the point. Let me try to get back to some of the substantial issues that I want to make in, in the relatively short time uh, that I have. Because I just want to give a reassurance to, to Liam Kerr, to Margaret Mitchell, to the Conservative benches that we are absolutely not complacent. Let me put it on the record, as my predecessor uh, did as well, that violent crime is still too high. Uh, can I give you an absolute assurance that we are not resting on our laurels, that we believe that too many young people still carry knives. One young person carrying a knife is one uh, too many. And that we do want to tackle the unreported uh, crime issue. And there are many good suggestions across this chamber on how we do that. Um, can I just touch upon uh, one other issue that was raised uh, during the debate? I I'm going to try my best as much as I possibly can uh, to, 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 to rise above the politics of this. Here comes another but, because there was one thing that I just cannot let go, which was uh, the accusation of falling police numbers under the SNP, quote unquote, uh, from the Conservative bench. I can't let that go because uh, there are now 938 more officers than we inherited when we came to power. I will shortly. Uh, but there has been a decrease of 19,588 officers in England and Wales. So to accuse us of falling police numbers when your own government has presided over a 13% is hypocrisy of the worst kind. I give way to Daniel uh, Johnson. Daniel Johnson. So just on the numbers, I mean, would the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that we've, we've lost uh, since 2013 uh, over 300 officers from, from local divisions. And what's more, we also acknowledge that we have seen increases in non-sexual violent crimes both in 2015-16 and 2016-17. And will he outline what he will do if that continues in the next data release? Hamza, you I, I will, and I think it's important to listen to what the police say about the, the kind of centralised, uh, localised argument. In fact, one of the great things about Police Scotland is the ability to use a national resource uh, and then uh, that, that has uh, major local, local impact. So I think we should listen to the police on that. Uh, I wasn't dismissing the point that you can have one or two year figures uh, that we should take note of. I think that is important. I will come back to to non-sexual offences, uh, but also sexual offences that we have seen, unfortunately, and, and I do use this word uh, purposely, a trend. Uh, we have seen a rising trend in, in, in sexual offences. Can I come to the other political parties and the amendments uh, that, that they have put down? Uh, Daniel Johnson's amendment we will be uh, accepting. Uh, I thought his speech was very thoughtful, uh, as, I, as, I, as I often have found him uh, to be, so we'll be accepting uh, that amendment and his point around ensuring that we invest uh, is an important one, and I've had a list of investments that we've made, but because of time, uh, I won't go into that. Can I also join with others across the chamber who thought Lee MacArthur's uh, amendment was very good, not selected, but I thought it was a very uh, important uh, point around through care. Can I give them some assurance that in the next few months, the Scottish Government will be working with community justice partners to see what more we can do in relation to through care, but an important uh, one. Uh, I really don't have time, if you'll forgive me, I'm, I'm coming to the end. Uh, Liam Kerr, I would just say, uh, you talked a lot about the accuracy of figures. There is an inaccuracy in your motion. 
Uh, I would have thought the sensible thing would have been to have withdrawn uh, that amendment yeah. because the VRU did yeah. offer a clarification uh, on the reported comments made, uh, uh, if I can say that. So can I just say, and, and this is the last point, I know time uh, is against me, uh, uh, presiding uh, officer, the central point uh, is one that I'm going to keep reiterating uh, as the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and I'm unapologetic about that. And it's an appeal to all of my colleagues, but perhaps particularly to the Conservative benches, that we must never fall into the trap that suggests there is a tension between strengthening the rights of victims, which there must be, and the rehabilitation of offenders. They are two sides of the same coin. If we truly want to see less victims of crime, we must, as I think Daniel Johnson used this phrase in, in the previous debate, we must preserve the hope of rehabilitation. And when Liam Kerr talked about difficult decisions, I don't doubt that I have difficult decisions and this government has difficult decisions to make, but so too do he and the opposition. And I've often found Liam Kerr to be very thoughtful uh, and not reactionary to, to issues and when I've dealt with him uh, one to one. And can I say to him that all the evidence on this is utterly irrefutable. Short sentences of less than 12 months are simply nowhere near as effective in rehabilitating offenders as community payback orders. My challenge to Liam Kerr and others is to examine the evidence, speak to the experts, and when it comes to the presumption against short sentences of 12 months, please do the right thing. And the last word, and I appreciate this, I'm running over time, the presiding officer, the last word I give to Callum Hutchison, who is one of those involved in Street and Arrow, a project that's been mentioned across the chamber. And he said, to quote him directly, the SVRU has absolutely transformed my life. They have helped repair a broken person. They believed in me when no one else did. Ian Murray, my project lead, gave me the opportunity to become a trainee with Street and Arrow, which gave me hope in the future. I am now a mentor helping guys just like myself, and it is the most rewarding thing I have ever done. The ripple effect from the SVRU helping me is massive. My family get the benefits, my community get the benefits. I'm no longer a drain on the NHS or in prison. Everyone at the SVRU has helped me get to a place I never thought was possible where I have peace in my life, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on violence reduction in Scotland, progress and future priorities. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. Uh, we have three questions. The first question is that amendment 13995.1 in the name of Liam Kerr, which seeks to amend motion 13995 in the name of Hamza Youssef on violence reduction in Scotland, progress and future priorities be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13995.1 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes 27, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 13995.3 in the name of Daniel Johnson, which seeks to bend the motion in the name of Hamza Youssef is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 13995 in the name of Hamza Youssef as amended on violence reduction in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 13995 in the name of Hamza Youssef as amended is yes, 86, no, zero. There were 26 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore 
agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.